Saigon, April the 30th, 8 o'clock. The last American helicopter on the roof of the American embassy prepares to lift off the last of the evacuees fleeing before the advancing communist armies. This scene, in fact every scene in this report, was filmed by a UPITN camera team who chose to remain behind in the beleaguered capital to record the final victory of the Viet Cong and North Vietnamese in South Vietnam. The American airlift only took a fraction of those who wanted to leave, and for hours after the last departure, scores of people still crowded onto the embassy roof in the vain hope of rescue. One of them was an American employer who tried to get all his staff out. I had one select man that should definitely have left. I was waiting for him. He's sitting up here now, and here we are. How do you rate the chances? Uh, negligible now. Do you think the last ones have gone? I think they're all gone. I think these people up here are committing suicide staying up here, but what can you do? Those who failed on that last day to get a place on the helicopters and who had reason to fear the communist takeover made for the only route that still offered a chance of escape, the Saigon River. Hundreds scrambled in panic onto any boats they could reach, not caring how they got aboard or what they left behind. For all of these people, it was, in fact, a voyage in vain. The communists had already captured the port of Vung Tau at the mouth of the river. By an ironic coincidence, as the overloaded ships cast off, their passengers watched helplessly as the last flights of American helicopters passed overhead, making for the certain safety of the American fleet out in the South China Sea. Back in the city, normal patterns of behavior broke down. In a climate of every man for himself, American homes, offices, and stores were looted of everything. The American embassy was ransacked in a matter of hours, despite a government warning that looters would be shot on sight. What wasn't worth taking was simply junked on the streets. The junk wasn't just paper. The streets were also littered by small arms and other items of military kit thrown away by South Vietnamese soldiers. The discarded equipment even ran to tanks, some damaged, but some also abandoned intact by their crews as they fled before the communists. The South Vietnamese army began to disintegrate. Even the crack airborne units took off their uniforms and threw away their weapons. From the presidential palace, General Min ordered all troops to cease fighting, a decision that pleased at least one paratrooper we spoke to. I'm very happy that General Min uh, come, see? So, uh, uh, I see very happy, I cannot say anything now. You think it's right to stop Yeah, that's fighting. right, yeah. Because the Vietnamese people all the way, but more than 25 years now. So now we don't stop fighting, you know. I'm very happy, you know, very happy for a whole lot of kids and me. All the people of the, the Vietnamese army. What are you going to do yourself now? Right now, if the peace, if I don't have the job, I can take care of one taxi, I can ride around, make the money every the day for my wife and my baby. Anybody happy, don't want to fight anymore. Not everyone saw defeat so optimistically. This officer shot himself in front of the soldiers' monument a couple of hours before the communists entered the city. And then, shortly after midday, came the climax of 30 years of fighting. The first North Vietnamese troops entered the city, packed into trucks that flew the red and blue flag of the Communist Provisional Revolutionary Government, the PRG.
Minutes later, their Russian-made tanks smashed down the gates of the presidential palace and took up positions in the grounds. There was no resistance. South Vietnamese troops were soon flushed out and surrendered without a fight. So, on its final day, the communist offensive ended without bloodshed, but with a display of potential firepower that impressed even the most jaded observers of the war. The new masters in Saigon, or Ho Chi Minh City as they called it, were clearly delighted. It had been a very disciplined arrival, the result of careful and detailed planning in which every unit knew precisely where to go and what to do, and it had all gone without a hitch. Inside the palace, General Duong Van Min, Big Min, South Vietnam's president for only two days, formally capitulated. He greeted his communist captors with the words, you have come, the revolution has come, and then declared he was handing over power to people who deserved it more than he did. He was led away with his government ministers to a waiting jeep, consoled slightly by the knowledge that his surrender broadcast had, at any rate, avoided unnecessary bloodshed. For the rest of the day, North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops marched steadily into Saigon. Hardened regulars in jungle battle dress, some pushing bikes, others in the more casual uniforms of guerrilla fighters. They were a disciplined force. Among the thousands who arrived, there wasn't a single reported case of theft, drunkenness, rape or shooting. People who hours earlier had feared for their lives now turned out on the streets to cheer and welcome. The sense of relief in Saigon was almost tangible. The victors seemed as concerned to win the cooperation of the vanquished as the vanquished were to give it. And indeed, such cooperation was essential since Saigon now had no police force to control day-to-day -day law and order. The relaxing of tension made for an almost holiday atmosphere as the celebrations of victory got underway. The first demonstrators on the streets were the Buddhists, many of whom had long opposed the military regime in Saigon and the involvement of the Americans in the war. Other groups soon followed, and the city returned almost to normal within 48 hours. The new rulers issued warnings that looters would be shot, and the lawlessness of the last days of South Vietnam ceased immediately. As the first day of peace for 30 years dawned in Vietnam, the banks and some shops remained closed. But in Saigon's markets, it was business as usual. Prices of meat and vegetables rose slightly in the first two days of communist rule and then leveled out. And the city's black markets continued to flourish. There were, of course, some changes. In the main market, traders were quick to peddle a new line in flags. With virtually every building and home being decorated for the forthcoming victory celebrations, demand was brisk for the red banner with the yellow star, the national flag of North Vietnam. Lapel-sized liberation flags were also a popular choice, along with the ubiquitous posters of the man whose dream was now fulfilled, Ho Chi Minh.
Though there were few immediate supply problems, the long-term future is not so secure. Saigon may, for example, become a city of bicycles like Hanoi and Peking. Petrol is scarce and costs the equivalent of up to 10 US dollars a gallon on the black market. Since nearly all South Vietnam's needs were previously met and paid for by the Americans, fuel is certain to become even more scarce and expensive, and it can't be long before most of Saigon's Hondas are driven off the streets. Another event to signal the change of regime, the pulling down of the South Vietnamese army monument in front of the National Assembly building. It was never a popular statue with the people of Saigon. The cynics used to say it showed an American soldier pushing his South Vietnamese counterpart in front of him into battle. Its destruction was ordered by the new city government and scores of people turned out to chip away at the two huge cement figures. After a couple of hours' frantic work, the monument was toppled amidst great jubilation. Two weeks after the communist takeover, some schools reopened. At this one, a black uniformed communist cadre began the first course in what's officially called re-education. Crowded round them were the students who would later reenact the liberation of the South in what's become the traditional communist propaganda play, the Americans and their evil reactionary allies against the people's revolutionary forces. Other instructors were drilling children in rehearsals for the parades and demonstrations that would form a large part of the official victory celebrations to be spread over three days. In the past, many students avoided conscription, especially if their fathers had enough money to bribe the right officials. But Hanoi was calling the tune now, and everyone had to march to it. The first appearance of the new authorities came a week after the military takeover. From the balcony of the presidential palace, members of Saigon's military management committee addressed a mass rally of troops assembled to celebrate not only their own recent victory, but also the 21st anniversary of the defeat of the French at Dien Bien Phu. About 30,000 people turned out to watch. After the speeches, the inevitable parade, led by posters of Ho Chi Minh. The next day, foreign journalists had the opportunity of getting to know Saigon's new leaders better, when the committee's chairman, General Tran Van Tra, held a press conference. Through an interpreter, he left no one in any doubt that he'd taken over all aspects of the city's affairs. Closely united in their task, the revolutionary administration of the city will, together with the people, settle all problems and wipe out all difficulties. 
A week later, another rally introduced the Provisional Revolutionary Government itself. On the balcony, the North Vietnamese Army Chief of Staff, and next to him, the PRG's number one, Huynh Tan Pat. Then came North Vietnam's Le Duc Tho, who negotiated the Paris peace agreements, and Madame Vinh, the PRG's foreign minister. All of them looked highly pleased as North Vietnamese tanks led the victory parade. A whole division of troops took part, 10,000 men. But as North Vietnam always maintained it had no troops in the south, every soldier in the parade wore the badge of the PRG. As the parade of hardware went on, the overriding impression was one of finality, that the communists had established beyond all question a tight and unopposed control over the land and people that had suddenly become theirs. Without the huge American investment that supported its economy, South Vietnam will need the help of all its people to make the inevitable transition to a socialist system. And though the conquerors will brook no political opposition, they will probably hope for genuine cooperation as they move away from the art of war and towards the less spectacular but more complex art of government.